um, Office of, of Director of the Common Fund, who gave a talk earlier about this mechanism, um, is joining us. And um, then we have four other panelists who are um, their recent recipients uh, through the HR HR mechanism. Um, and they have agreed to, um, uh, to, to tell us a little bit about their experiences with this mechanism. Um, and because it's different, I think that'll be particularly valuable. Um, and so our, our, I think I'll introduce serially our, our, our panelists. Then uh, those four panelists are, are Giovanni Bosco, um, who uh, is at Dartmouth, um, and a molecular and systems bio, right, Gio? Do you go by Giovanni or Gio? Gio is fine. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Carlos Vargas Irwin, who's at, who's at Brown. Um, um, April Clarkson at the University of Delaware. Um, and John Zhang, who's also at Dartmouth. So, you know, welcome, you guys. I think what I'd like to do to get us started um, is just to ask each of you, um, and I'll, I'll call on you, um, to talk just a little bit about um, your experience with this, um, you know, with the HRHR, right? You each have a different mechanism, but one of the questions that I asked Robbie was, well, how, how do you know that your work, you know, sort of fits in this category? Um, and so if, if each of you could just, just very briefly sort of describe how you how you decided to apply for this mechanism um, what it was it about the research you were doing that that made you think hi you know this is high risk but high reward I'm going to go for this um, right so so maybe I'll, I'll start with April and um, maybe we could either four of you could each do that and then we'll we'll go from there sure yeah I know um, can you hear me all right yes Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, and thank you for putting together this really nice panel and to Robbie for his fantastic talk earlier that I think really nicely overviewed the, the different mechanisms. Um, so I applied for the NIH Director's New Innovator Award. Um, so one of the, the HRHR award mechanisms. And the, the work of my group then is that it's interdisciplinary in nature. So at this interface between um, engineering, chemistry, and biology. And we really aim then to establish and apply new molecular tools for controlling the, the, the microenvironment of cells for improving human health. Um, and one focus of our work then is on creating these dynamic multidimensional human disease models from the bottom up to try to understand mechanism and then trying to uh, not only establish them but evaluate uh, new uh, therapeutic targets. So the, the nature of the work is, is high risk, high reward in nature. Um, particularly for addressing intractable diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF. And um, I think that in terms of the impact, and I think this also speaks to why one might apply for the mechanism, um, is this really a, allowed um, my work then to take multiple sort of high risk projects together in parallel, um, rather than trying to split those up over different uh, grant mechanisms. Um, and it gives versatility to um, not only then in that Parallel, uh, having parallel execution for rapid progress and innovation, but also to be able to pivot uh, depending on what you observe um, and providing the resources to, to do that. Um, versus if you broke those into individual diagrams with a more defined scope uh, that was very fixed in nature, um, then it might slow progress overall. Um, but uh, happy to take questions and also to hear uh, what the other panelists have to share. Sure. Jean, do you mind going next? Absolutely. Thank you, Brett, for the opportunity. Very nice to see my colleagues across the panel. And thank you, Ravi, for all the support and then the fantastic talk this morning. So I'm actually in a graduating class of HR, HR transformative research. And Ravi and I, we just met a few weeks ago where I present our work as a concluding um, uh, presentation for this year. So I'm a biomedical engineer, similar to April, but I more work on the device uh, arena. And uh, my, my funding has been traditionally coming from, you know, um, engineering focused agencies, for example, the NSF, the Defense, DOD, DOE. And um, for this project, you know, we, 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 we kind of having this idea for, uh, for a number of years, which is how to harvest the energy from heart, right? So heart is a mechanical pump. And then given the scenario, we have very, uh, a lot of, uh, implantable medical devices. So, so there was an energy crisis down the pipeline. How will you be able to supply the energy without do extra surgery replacing the batteries? So that was the, the major uh, thesis. But this is obviously, I think, 
outside the boundary of many NIH institutes. And for the HR HR program, like Ravi uh, Pivot uh, State in the Morning, it's really a venture capital model, right? In that sense, you really take that brief idea without even the so-called custom uh, approval yet, but you dare to invest in the team, in the PI, and therefore to validate it uh, uh, over the next five years. So I think for transform transformative research, that's really go beyond a single PI to look at a multi-PI scenario, which is exactly the team composition we have. I mean, I'm an engineer, I work with cardiologists. We work together for a few years. We have some other ideas. We also have this brand new idea. And that's new brand idea. We tried HR, HR, we got it the first time. And um, so over the past five years, it was very exciting. We have five, six journal papers. Every journal paper have a cover image. So that shows the power of HR, HR program which is really define the frontier for the, for the research area. Now, my only hope is moving forward, we can have a series B, series C funding. <laughs> if we follow that BC model, we can continue to sustain the momentum. But I'm open to hear what I, you know, my, my peers have to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Carlos, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. And uh, thanks again for, uh, uh, for inviting me to participate in the panel. Uh, so, uh, right now, I'm uh, participating in the, uh, the New Innovator Award program, and uh, my project um, is also an interdisciplinary effort, which uh, I guess also adds to, to, to the risk and the potential rewards. Um, the project that I'm working on um, is, uh, is focused on uh, improving um, neuromotor decoding, that is uh, predicting movement uh, based on uh, neural activity. And this has uh, implications for neuroprosthetics, uh, but also uh, and for the open assistive technologies, but also for understanding how uh, computation occurs in cortical circuits. So the, the, main, um, the main idea was to, to improve neuromotor decoding by incorporating uh, artificial vision uh, and artificial sensing into the decoding pipeline. Uh, so, um, my previous background was mostly on the neuroscience side, um, but um, uh, I have strong collaborators that are experts in uh, the computer vision aspect. Uh, so um, essentially this, uh, this project uh, allowed us to, to sort of put that vision together and bring these two areas of expertise uh, to develop uh, new technologies and better understanding uh, of the brain. Um, it's, uh, it's really been um, sort of career changing for me, uh, it's had a huge impact on uh, the work we're able to do and uh, just how we could go from, uh, from a vision and knowing like, this is what we want to do. These are the tools we have to, uh, to address uh, this, uh, this line of inquiry and going from there to actually have uh, a research uh, program. So uh, I'd also like to, to thank uh, Ravi and uh, uh, everyone behind the, um, the new innovator program for that wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Carlos. Gio. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Brett, for um, including me. And um, thank you to the organizers for letting me participate. I guess I would start off by saying, you know, for anyone in the audience who has a significant imposter syndrome like, like I do, I would strongly encourage you to apply to, for, through these uh, mechanisms because they really are um, career transforming and, and, and anyone can get them, right? You don't have to be, um, you don't have to be well-established or, or, or famous to, to get one of these awards. And um, for me, it really meant um, sending my career and, and research program in a completely different direction. So I applied for the Director's Pioneer Award and really we were asking a very old question, not a new question, but an old biological question as to whether uh, traits and specifically behavior could be inherited through multiple generations. And this question being old and also somewhat controversial, um, we could bring to bear um, new technology and um, a really powerful model system like Prosophila to revisit a lot of the past um, ideas and ways that folks have been thinking about it. Um, and we found some very interesting um, uh, findings that now we're expanding on. But with regards to um, these mechanisms being really uh, transformative and useful um, at every stage of anyone's career, 
I, I really encourage everyone to take a serious look and, and apply. Um, no idea is too crazy. Um, you know, very little if no um, data is required and um, just go for it. So, so this is all very interesting to hear. And, and you know, one of, one of some of the questions that I had as I learned about these, and I'm sure much of the audience has to do is uh, a little bit more procedural in terms of assembling an application and the review process for the application, which I, I asked Robbie a little bit about that. And you know, like the, well, no preliminary data really um, question, um, which a lot of us have been trained to produce. Um, and in, and in terms of that, I was, I was interested to see if, if any of the panelists or even Robbie would want to jump in and, and talk a little bit about the, the, the review process, um, you know, what you guys you know, put together with the expectation of the review process, um, uh, what was an interview like, um, you know, and um, because that, that, I think that procedure is as outlined is a little bit different. Um, so I'll let you guys jump in as you, as you have thoughts. Well, I, I guess I can share first, perhaps, um, just something that um, I, I definitely ag agree with what Giovanni was saying, like that do apply, <laughs> right? Like um, I also, uh, um, I think we all do, like, you know, have aspects of imposter syndrome that's really nicely documented um, as something that's really quite common. Uh, but that, you know, that shouldn't, you know, like looking at sometimes looking at what's out there in the public arena then may make you think, oh, I, I don't think I fit, I shouldn't apply, but um, you, really it's worth trying. Um, and I guess in terms of the application process, then something that was helpful to me along the way is to not necessarily just apply once. <laughs> so the first time I applied, um, so we, we build these tools and we apply them to different problems. And so when I first applied, I, um, talked about really what could have been two separate, <laughs> two separate new innovator type of pr proposals then and like taking and de developing these tools and applying them to two different biological problems. And then the feedback I received for the, re the first round of the review process then was that I, was had, I had two different proposals, <laughs> right? And that I really should just focus on uh, one of those uh, biological problems um, with those types of tools. And that feedback really helped me um, then refine my ideas and the proposal and then to apply again. And so um, there are, the, as, as Robbie nicely articulated for the different mechanisms, different stages in the review process. Um, and so then it was only in my final application then that I made it through the full stage, um, stages of those processes. And then there is the opportunity also to, while there isn't an interview for the new innovator mechanism, there is an opportunity to respond to the reviews. Um, it's not something that goes back to the reviewers, but allows you to, again, articulate how what you're proposing fits the mechanism and the context of the reviews. So that's definitely something that's worth doing as well. Yeah, so if I may add, it's, it's not unusual for people to, to submit applications multiple times before eventually getting the award. But each, it's uh, also important to point out, though, that each application is considered a new application. It's not a resubmission. It's not a A1 type application. So if you do submit again, uh, please be sure that you don't mention any previous submission. If you do, then that's grounds for administrative withdrawal. And the other thing that April pointed out is that I do give the opportunity for scored HRHR applicants to provide a two-page response to the summary statements. This is an unusual feature in that it allows NIH staff to go through them and read the summary statement, read the response, and help to clarify misconceptions that the panel might have made or objective errors that the panel might have made and, and to reinforce why what's being proposed really is well aligned with the spirit of that initiative. That's very useful for NIH staff. Yeah, if I may, I just want to add on, you know, I know Brad, you asked would I be the question about how much data is needed, right? Whether it's a clear black and white line. I think, you know, from my own perspective, um, Maybe the preliminary data is not needed, but the logic of thinking need to be there, which means you know you have to look into the question in a very hard way. You may not generate publishable data yet, you know per se, but you have been thinking about the problem. You have been going to the conferences, you know, talk to the peers, identify these frontiers in your area, and and think about the question in a very hard way. 
So when you pitch this idea, when you present the idea, even though you may not have any publication to back it up yet, or have very limited amount of data, but the rationale is solid and the, the, the logic of thinking is clear. So I think I just want to separate this two, you know, without data, meaning, you know, it's a, it's a fact, you don't have any publication yet, but this thinking may have been going on for one or two years, right? And you just simply don't have that resource and that, you know, that publishable data yet. But uh, that, that way of thinking will be, you know, in my own experience, appreciated very much by the reviewers. Um, maybe if I can just uh, add on to that, um, as Ravi mentioned, uh, well, for the New Innovator Award and some of these other awards, uh, it, it is um, also investigator centered. So uh, sort of building, uh, building up on, uh, on sort of data versus no data, uh, even if you don't have data yet, you have essentially to, uh, to show that you have the, the level of expertise and access to the right tools to accomplish the goals uh, you, uh, you're proposing. And yeah, I think it really is more about having that, that clear vision, uh, even if you don't have, yeah, even if you don't have the, the preliminary data to, to back it up, which I think is one of the unique and really uh, uh, useful for me parts of the, the mechanism. Gio. Yeah, I agree with every, everything that's been said so far. And I'd like to offer a very brief word of caution <clears throat> For when you choose colleagues, uh, friends to to talk about your ideas and show your uh, your proposal to, um, I I think you know um, I I got a lot of weird looks and um, and non not really very supportive comments because we've all been socialized to be so conservative um, um, in the way that we pitch our ideas. And this is really different, right? And I think it wasn't until I found um, really creative and risk-taking uh, colleagues and friends, some of which you already had gotten some of these awards, that, that I found um, folks that could really give me um, the support and, and encouragement that I really needed to, to believe that I could do this. Um, so just keep that in mind that when you go around seeking feedback, um, uh, just you know, um, keep everything in context that this is a very different type of application. Um, so, you know, it seems like what I'm hearing to a certain extent, and John, you, you said something that I think sounds important to me. I haven't applied for one of these, but I uh, want to bounce this off of you guys as panelists. And that is that even though you may not have, hey, here's this preliminary data that indicates here's paper number one, here's paper number two, that sort of thing. Uh, it sounds like what you're saying is um, that the vetting the ideas, um, it, you know, that, that setting up that this is a really valuable area, even though it's high risk, um, is, is an important part of one of these applications. Would you say that's, that's true? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that's that's true. And that's also I, I, I try to make it a bit clear in a way of, you know, all the applicants are well qualified to apply these programs. And I think for this specific four different program and the HHR, they need the fingers on the pulse, right? Really know what's going on in the field and what is heading to. I think have this visionary um, uh, idea is, is a key for it. Right. And uh, if I may add to that, you can't just propose, hey, I'm going to cure cancer or diabetes or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. You got to back it up with some compelling logic. You have to have a good idea, a key insight that's really driving this. So one question that I had had to do with the sort of the review process. Um, so Ravi, maybe you can comment on this. Are um, the review panelists, um, are they typically, are some of them typically former HR, HR recipients? Um, you, you said in the, in your talk that some of them are, you know, necessarily generalized, like have general expertise, but aren't experts necessarily in that field. And then there are right. also people who can speak to that. Um, but have any of the panelists been asked to serve? Uh, sure. uh, is that, oh, is that who you recruit? It's not, I mean, there's, it's not uncommon for former or current HRHR awardees to serve 
on the panel, but there's no set ratio of HRHR awardees that we ask to serve on the panels. We just want broad thinking people. And it happens that, that HRHR awardees tend to be broad thinking individuals. Okay. Now, I haven't gotten any questions in the chat and no one has, has raised their hands yet, but I assume you guys have some interest and uh, maybe some of you have some, some, some wild ideas that are out there. So I wanna encourage you guys to, um, you know, to, to chime in with your questions. Um, you know, heck, you could, you could even pitch, you know, you could even, you know, pitch. You've got, a, you've got a welcome audience, you know, based on what Gio said here, some, some creative thinkers and, and so forth. Does anybody have anything they want to they want to jump in and ask? Tumbleweeds. <laughs> While people are thinking, I just want to point out that we do have a lot of resources on our website, and if you want to calibrate you know, your idea or your background, you we list the funded research for each, each of these initiatives. So we have links to the abstracts. You can see what's been funded. We also have links to brief bios of all the awardees, so you can see who's been funded and you know, and then go from there. Okay, we, we did get one question in chat here. It's a general one. What is the interview process like? And I think it's, it's the Pioneer Award that has the interview. So Geo, you could probably, you have the Pioneer, right? Or got the Pioneer. So maybe you can comment on that and if Robbie wants to chime in. Sure. Um... It's been a few years, so I don't know if it's changed. Um, but the, the initial, okay, great. The, the initial application goes in um, and um, for the Pioneer required um, three letters uh, uh, from, from, um, of support from colleagues that are not at your home institution that I've never worked for or with, um, that I didn't share any grants with so so those um, um, those were important um, um, preludes to then the next phase where um, if you move on to the interview process basically you get um, fifteen minutes um, to um, to present your idea and uh, I think it was ten minute presentation and then five minutes for questions do I remember that correctly no. 15 minutes presentation, 15 minutes discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, and, um, and that was, um, that and then, you know, you're ushered out um, and, um, and then finally you get, you get a score. Um, but the, the discussion with the panel um, for me was a lot of fun. Um, the panel was clearly very uh, supportive and very enthusiastic and interested, and I'm sure they were for every for everyone, even the ones that they they didn't get fundable scores. But um, um, it was a very it was very positive um, experience, um, and um, yeah, just preparing for that for that uh, 15 minute presentation was uh, was also um, uh, a great experience. Um, I practiced in front of my kids, um, which which was great, right? Because I knew the panel was gonna be very broad and I had to be able to speak to um, a very broad audience. Um, hope that answers the question. I think so, I think that's neat. I mean, we, we have another really interesting question here. Um, what is the perception of investigators applying for these kinds of awards who are at undergraduate institutions? Is this seen as a feasibility issue or is it project dependent? We do welcome uh, applications from all sorts of institutions, and we are trying uh, enhanced outreach to those that don't are, that are not research intensive. So we do welcome uh, applications from institutions that have teaching as their primary mission, but you still have to demonstrate that you have the infrastructure necessary to to conduct what you're proposing to do. And if I may uh, to to Geo. I still remember his presentation. I was startled by that. It was so beautiful. Drosophilus and how the you know exposure to wasps and how that can really affect the, the progeny. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds like you made an impression, Geo. Um, you know what the the, um, the question in chat about 
PUIs you know, sort of raises a question. And I, and I think it's, it's something I wanted to delve into a little bit on the panel um, because this is a different mechanism and it is a high risk. Um, how do you go about uh, sort of assessing productivity on a grant like this? Um, you know, the, the like, what, it, what if it just, you know, crashes and burns spectacularly? Um, you know, that certainly is one of the possibilities. Um, I, I'm curious what, what the panelists' thoughts are about, you know, how they approach that, how they measured their own productivity in, in terms of this, um, you know, how did it work out? <laughs> was it transformative? Did it explode? Um, I'm sort of curious to hear to hear your uh, experiences with it. Yeah, maybe I'll just start. John, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks, Brad, for calling me up. <laughs> so I think I have I have a very uh, a few simple metrics uh, parameters for myself. I mean, for this program. One is because, you know, this is really touch upon the uh, innovative ideas, right? So whoever carry that out, hopefully, you know, for that researcher that will define his or her own uh, research path. And uh, for my own lab, you know, under this HR, HR program, we have uh, three researchers uh, since then uh, came out for launching their own faculty careers. And the second metrics is really the impact. So because I'm a biomedical engineer and especially looking to medical devices. So this HR, HR program enabled some of the very interesting industry collaborations, which is go beyond my own expectation. For example, back in 2017, uh, we launched collaboration with Facebook. So it's an it's a industry which you know, I've, I've never thought about. And I think you know, they're probably not interested in medical technology rather than social platforms. But they indeed, you know, some of the work we have done under this program enable that collaboration. So the third one is really looking to the student training. I think in the chat, they talk about undergrad institution and, you know, Dharmaris, we are not undergrad institution per se, but we focus a lot for undergraduate education, right? So Gio know this uh, same as me, we have a graduate school structure. So over the time, we'll be able to recruit very top graduate students. And uh, like I said, in the very beginning, you know, part of them, move on to launch their own faculty career. But we have a recent um, instance where the students uh, go to launch their own company under the innovative program we have at Dharmers. So I think this, this few parameters in my own mind is really benchmark, you know, based on the very innovative, innovative nature of this program. Thank you, John. April, would you like to share? Well, I think that, that John highlighted some really um, nice, I think, you know, outcomes um, and metrics of productivity. Um, I think that that's something that I guess just to add to the idea of, I guess, undergraduate training, um, I think graduate and then postdoctoral training, like that's definitely um, something that continues to have really long-term impact. And, you know, certainly in addition to the, the potential publications that come out of the work, um, and the, the interdisciplinary training and the, you know, training people to take on important problems and to take risk and how to manage risk. Um, I think that that's, that that's really important too. Um, and, you know, we're still uh, working to get out some of our really higher impact publications um, on the work that's coming out. Um, but I think that, you know, it's going to be a portfolio of productivity that comes out of the work as well. Um, and so, you know, those are, you know, lots of different uh, metrics of, of potential impact, I guess, there. Thanks, April. Carlos, would you like to share? Uh, sure, of course. Uh, so uh, right now we're, we're kind of right at, around the midpoint uh, in, in our project. Uh, and sort of in this first half, um, we focused on uh, sort of uh, building the tools uh, that, we, uh, that we want to use uh, to um, to set up uh, the data collection we want and also the, the analytics we'll need um, to, to accomplish our goals. So um, I, I agree with uh, all, all the previous terms, uh, all the previous uh, points made. Uh, and uh, I also, uh, so on a, on a personal note, as an early stage investigator, uh, this, um, uh, this award allowed me to, for the first time, sort of assemble my own team. <laughs> And uh, that was, has been a wonderful experience. And um, 
in uh, yeah, in terms of productivity, I, I would also like to to highlight um, also the the analysis tools, the software you develop, uh, and how you can uh, share that. Uh, that's uh, I, I think that's also um, a valuable contribution that that often will not um, get the, uh, as much attention as say like paper publishing. Uh, likewise, uh, the data you generate and being able to share that da data, uh, especially when um, when it's there that it's that's not uh, uh, generally available uh, to to other to other research groups. For example, in our case, having a single unit recording from um, from hundreds of neurons uh, together with a three D motion capture of an animal moving. Uh, uh, we we're just uh, starting to um, to build up our uh, um, our, our database uh, of, of of this kind, uh, and uh, I think when when we uh, as we plan to 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 release it for uh, for uh, the broader community, I think it will be a great resource as well. Geo. Yeah, if I could add, I think it's safe to say. Um, that all of the HRHR mechanisms have been wildly successful. Um, and, and I hope that they will be continued to be used as a model to transform the rest of the review process and granting process at NIH. And I think one of the reasons why it's been so successful is that productivity is de-emphasized, right? Is that, you know, the, the inherent nature of of really creative research is high risk. And there's always a chance that there will be no productive outcome, right? But at least we've been able to ask really big, important questions. And so, um, I don't know, for those of us who will be out there serving on NIH and NSF panels in the future, I would just hope don't pay so much attention on, on, on productivity and outcome. Maybe just focus on how wonderful and creative um, um, the ideas are. Well, thank you guys for those perspectives. Yeah. You know, that, that's why I asked the question because you know, it's, it's striking that this is a different way of thinking about things. So um, briefly from the NIH side? Yep. So, you know, there, we, of course, we are very interested in outcomes of these programs, of these initiatives. There does seem to be a latent phase in productivity for HRHR awards because they start at a much earlier stage, often just an idea. So it takes time to build things up and generate enough data to actually publish something. That's something that we've documented. And we have also, of course, asked the question, well, has the investment been worth it? We've uh, spent over a billion dollars just on the new innovator award program. So we had, for each of these initiatives, we had uh, the Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is part of the Institute for Defense Analysis, conduct an independent evaluation of the outcomes, comparing the productivity or the outcomes of HRHR awardees for that initiative to comparison groups. For example, with the pioneers, it was matched R1 investigators who had, who were just as accomplished as the Pioneer Awardees, but didn't have a Pioneer Award. Or another outcomes uh, comparison group was HHMI investigators. So, but for all four initiatives, the conclusion was that it's the HRHR Awardees that tend to have, produce research that's more innovative and more impactful than the comparison groups, tr trying to control for all other variables. So it's something about the mechanism that you're allowed to go after risky ideas that you're allowed unusual flexibility to pivot research when you think it's necessary, that allows this unusual level of innovativeness and impact. So, so one of the questions, one of the things that occurs to me as I look at, you know, we have, you know, 40 something total participants here. So there are some people listening. And I wonder if some of them are thinking, might this be, I might have an idea. Um, and I wanna, I'm looking for, a reason to develop it and, and a way to do that. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, say I have an idea and I wanna go about vetting it. This is expanding geo on something you said earlier about like who you show it to, et cetera. Um, do you have suggestions? Do any of you have suggestions for um, what are the key things you should consider as you're vetting an idea? Um, maybe Ravi can comment on, on common pitfalls, or maybe you guys can too. Um, 
how would you suggest going about developing the idea, I guess, is really the question. So again, I'll just follow the same thing. You know, I, I, you guys can jump in or I could call on you sequentially. Um, you know, I want to avoid tumbleweeds. April's jumping in. Go, April. <laughs> well, I think I'll add one comment and hopefully others can add. I don't want to open, I guess, myself up to like, uh, you know, I guess potential flurry of emails, but I don't think that's going to happen. But we'll just be um, alluding to what Gio said earlier and that Ravi said earlier, like all of us are on the, the website, I think that I encourage people to go look at that. And anyone who's contacted me <laughs> to say, I'm, I have an idea, can you meet with me? Or, you know, our work is kind of parallel, like, I saw you apply to the mechanism, what are your thoughts? Um, I always meet with them. <laughs> um, and I think it's a bit of also trying to like pay it forward. I have been the great beneficiary of um, having fantastic colleagues uh, encourage me um, over time. And I, I think that um, I also am really passionate about pursuing innovation and continuing to, to advance science and technology. So I think that you'll find that all of the recipients are probably that way too. <laughs> so do, do reach out. Um, so just uh, in terms of an opportunity to vet your idea. Yeah, definitely. Anyone should feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss the crazier the, uh, the, the idea, the, the more excited I get. Um, I think with regards to like, you have an idea to your question, Brett, you have an, I have an idea, what do I do next? I think developing, um, for me, it was developing a very clear and as straight a line to a potential um, outcome. Um, was really important, right? Um, because I think having a great idea is, is a lot of fun, but then being able to think about how to actually answer the question uh, is, is really important. And I thought that that was sort of the crux of, um, of being able to convince the panel, the panelists um, that it could actually be done. Yeah, I just want to add on, um you know, among the four programs, the transformative research is multiple PI allowed, right? So that mechanism, you know, by definition, allow that internal vetting and the, the team vetting uh, scenario for Pioneer and then Innovator and other research programs, a single PI. And I talked to a few colleagues as well. I think some of them using the, the type of design thinking concept, which means you have an idea then you try to collect the feedback early stage as possible. I think, you know, April and Jail refer to that as well. Have a, a, a mechanism, talk to program directors, talk to previous awardees, and then get feedback early on that will help polish idea. Carlos, anything you want to add? Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with everything that's, that's been expressed. And yeah, I would like to, to underscore uh, yeah, getting in, in touch with program uh, with um, program officers and, and my interactions with with uh, everyone at NIH have always been very uh, very positive. Um, and um, yeah, no, uh, I think well uh, as we as we've mentioned, you you have to more than just an idea. You do have to have sort of a vision of where that idea is going, uh, and it, it's also worth uh, worth mentioning um, that. Uh, you should also think about sort of like what what way, uh, ways could it potentially crash and burn, and how can you mitigate those, uh, and and also devote some some effort to 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 really uh, thinking about sort of pitfalls and how to uh, how to navigate through them. And from the NIH side, I, at the end of my slideshow, I gave four email addresses, one for each of the initiatives. So if they're routine questions, you'll get a response from somebody in the office addressing your question. But if it's a question about scope, then for the Pioneer New Innovator Transformative Research Awards, that email is forwarded to me. And, and then, well, the response to the, to the person who sends the email is that, you know, that I have a method for scheduling calls. And I talk with many, many, many prospective applicants about their, uh, about the ideas that they have just to give low resolution feedback, whether or not it might be in scope or if it's aligned with what we're seeking. Um, and we, you know, we do have 
a lot of information on our website about pitfalls. We have each year we host a webinar for prospective applicants. We held uh, the webinars for this year in July or so, and they're available on our website. We go into details about the application and review processes, what's, what we stress are important aspects of the application, what you should really emphasize, and go into details about the review processes as well. We have DSROs for each of these initiatives. They give their perspectives on, on the mechanics of the review process. So I think uh, feedback is that those are very useful webinars. That's great. Well, so I, I also want to just encourage the audience members to, to ask questions. I know I've I had a lot of questions and I asked them and hopefully some of your questions have been answered, but I can't anticipate all of your questions. Um, um, OK, we have one question that just appeared in chat. If there's no preliminary data, are published data allowed to be cited or or written in the proposal? Yes, they are. Um... But for the Transformative Research Award uh, initiative, we are oops, we are um, piloting anonymized reviews. So you can cite work, but you can't claim that to be your own work in the uh, specific aims or the research strategy section. There is that nuance, but yeah, it's totally fine to to uh, cite published uh, published work. Uh, that helps to build your premise because you have to have a strong premise for what you're doing. Okay. So I, I wanna open it up now for the panel, right? I've, I've kind of steered this and asked a lot of questions and I, I hope they were good ones. Um, but I, I, I'm curious, what would you guys add um, to this? I know you guys have been very thoughtful in your, in your commentary to the questions I've asked, but um, you know, the, the, the best panelists panels are when the panelists, you know, take charge a little bit. So um, what, what do you what, what should we talk about? What do you guys want to add? I guess I can maybe comment just in terms of words of encouragement. Um, I think something that one of my mentors told me is, you know, you have to buy a ticket to win. Um, and so just to reemphasize what Gio said earlier, like do try, right? But you know, we've talked about some mechanisms for betting your ideas. Um, the other thing that had been asked of me is like, so when I was funded, I had several years as a, as a PI under my belt. Um, and so some people perceive that the new innovator mechanism is something that people only receive like, you know, during their first year or two as a PI um, and, I don't know the statistics on it uh, per se, but I can just tell you anecdotal information about my own experience is that, um, you know, we were a few years in at, to, at the point where I received funding. Um, I did, you know, uh, speak to um, that in my application, but people shouldn't be discouraged from applying from the mechanism as long as they meet the eligibility criteria. Um, and so something just to, that, that people have asked me about, and again, buy a ticket. <laughs> and I, I echo that and I you know my another hope is uh, hope Robbie's program get a double the budget so that way you know more PIs will be supported I have been serving as a reviewer for HR HR program for the past five years so I can tell new ideas are emerging every day so we we need the money we need more money for this community <laughs> but keep right trying now we're spending about $200 million a year on the HRHR program. It takes a little less than a third of the entire common fund budget. So it's, it's a lot. One thing I can say though, is maybe if the common fund HRHR program budget can't grow, we are seeing that these this design for applications and um, or high risk high reward research programs, we are inspiring other institutes at NIH for, to have their own uh, DP1, DP2 sort of programs. DP1 is the activity code for the pioneers. DP2 is the activity code for the new innovators. So we are seeing a proliferation of such programs across NIH. We're having a, we're broadening our impact that way. Great. Well, so as as host, I, I've just been reminded that I'm over time. So um, the next session is at one. I want to thank the panelists, um, uh, Robbie, Gio, Carlos, April, 
John, thank you so much for taking part in this panel. It's been very informative and appreciate it. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up, um, but um, thank you all to all the attendees as well. Um, thought this was very informative. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, take care. Thank you so much. Brett, really great job. Thanks so much, April. The, the, yeah. Really appreciate you guys taking part in this. I, I knew it was going to be exciting when I started looking at your, at, at like what you had accomplished and what your research was. And I, I spent way more time than I want to admit, like looking and being like, oh, that's so cool. That is really neat. And then, and then basically being like, I don't know if I can lead this panel there. They all do really cool stuff. And I, I don't feel like I belong, but it was. <laughs> I you did it well. You did excellent. It, it was an education <laughs> process for me. Like I'm just, and part of the reason we wanted to do this panel was because I don't think a lot of people know about HR. HR. Right? We tend to think about, oh, here's like I'm at a PUI, so we think R15s and NSF rubies. Uh, if you're at, you know, a place like URI, you think R01s. You think, you know, like, and but there are there's such a diversity of funding mechanisms out there that we thought this would be a neat. Um, a neat thing to explore uh, because it is so different. And yeah. uh, you, you guys were fantastic, by the way. So thank you for. No, uh, it's really fantastic. I didn't know how we would like fill the time, and it was it was seamless. <laughs> right on. And yep. your questions were awesome, and the fellow panelists were awesome. Thank you so much. And I do think, like particularly for the idea mechanism, um, the idea of funding groups, right? Like I have my little. Actually, I didn't show it, but my idea. <laughs> swag um but i think that you know no one from the university of delaware had ever received an hr hr before before i applied and anytime i ask around like people were like oh like you know probably really low probability for us right um and there, so that'd be discouraging and so i think hopefully this is really encouraging to the the other folks at the different idea institutions as well to draw their attention. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, and certainly at an, in an INBRI state, right? As program coordinator, I, I coordinate the faculty development process within Rhode Island. And so I sit in on all these faculty development meetings and we're talking, always talking about, you need to be using this to build your program so that you can apply for and become an independent investigator. And that's always the goal. Um, and knowing for myself, knowing more, but um, you know, it's always talk to program officers, talk to program officers. So this is a great opportunity to connect um, our Northeast Inbury state, idea states with, um, with people who've, who've walked that walk and program officers and whatever. So I greatly appreciate um, all of your time and energy. Uh, this is fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, everybody. Right. Nice to see you. Bye-bye right. now. Bye.